lovely uh, connection to remake. So here we are, a uh, lovely gathering. I'm glad to see many of the students and many new faces. Um, and we are going to have a wonderful little introduction by Patrick Binns, who is the Consul General of Canada and who has graciously helped to support this trip. Patrick. Thank you very much, Kay. I'm uh, delighted to be here with all of you, and as I was sitting in the back of the room, it uh, struck me that it wouldn't be hard for any of you to tell which one of us came from Boston. <laughs> actually came kind of through Boston from Canada, but uh, our consulate, um, Canada does have a consulate general in, um, in New England, based in Boston, and we service uh, all of New England, with the exception of Connecticut, but some people might argue, well, Connecticut, <laughs> anyway, I'll do that. Uh, but I'm, I'm delighted to uh, to be here with you, and want to thank Katie very much and uh, the Center uh, for Circumpolar Studies for the invitation to join with John uh, this evening. Uh, our role is pretty minuscule or less important, I think, in terms of uh, what you're all uh, looking forward to tonight. But it is a privilege to uh, be able to talk just for a few moments about the Canada-U.S. relationship. Uh, particularly its Arctic dimension. And um, while well, I often come to Montpelier, uh, this is the first time I've had the opportunity to partner with the Centre in any way, and uh, we're glad that we can work together on a subject that is close to our uh, collective hearts. Our two countries are united not only by the world's longest uh, and safest border and a huge trading relationship, but by a shared responsibility uh, relative to environmental stewardship and responsible resource development. And nowhere, perhaps, uh, is the remarkable and unique nature of the Canada-U.S. relationship felt more distinctly, probably, than right here in Vermont. Uh, Vermonters and their Canadian neighbors generally understand each other. Um, we go to school together, play sports together, uh, frequent each other's businesses, uh, respond to each other's emergencies, uh, so many family names in the state, you know, in this state um, have a French-Canadian origin or perhaps even some other part of Canada, so it is a, a close uh, relationship over time. Of course, the Arctic is fundamental to Canada's uh, national identity, as it is to America's, um, very much embedded in Canadian history and culture, and particularly for Arctic peoples, you know, it's, uh, the Arctic is really part of their soul, I think, the Inuit, the Inu, and other First Nations, um, especially, and their distinct cultural traditions represent an important piece of the rich multicultural fabric uh, that is Canada. The cultural legacy of the people in the region is immensely ancient. Um, over centuries, Arctic culture has given rise to arts of striking beauty, and Arctic culture continues to grow and evolve today in the contemporary world. Um, over supper I was uh, 
as we were meeting just before coming over, I was uh, reminded of when I first came to this post of being at the Canadian Studies program at Bowdoin College in Maine, and one of the scholars there was from northern Quebec uh, and Innu. Um, I asked her, you know, how do you think of yourself in terms of your identity? Do you think of yourselves as a Quebecer, as a Canadian? Um, or, you know, just how do you put that together? She said, well, because we're at a banquet this evening and it would be improper to do so, she said, I'm not going to show you what I would, would, might otherwise do. But she said, if I was to raise my blouse and show you my back, you would see my Mongolian birthmark, blue birthmark. And she said, my, my parents don't have it, but my grandfather has it. My children don't have it, but my grandchildren might, might have it. And she said, if you, know, if you understand people of the North, you come to understand that there is that relationship that exists whether we're in Canada, the United States, or in you know, Norway, or Russian territory, um, that we have common origins. And so we don't think of ourselves necessarily uh, as Canadians or Americans, but rather that, that Northern identity. And I think to a certain extent that helped me put in perspective the fact that, you know, uh, we're talking about something that's very unique and um, a great need to understand uh, the North and to uh, celebrate its uh, vibrant cultural history uh, and the opportunities. So we've long acknowledged, Canada's long acknowledged the tremendous potential that the Arctic holds, and in 2009, Canada launched its Northern Strategy, which lays out the government of Canada's vision for a new North and its commitment to ensure that vision comes to life for the benefit of all Canadians. Uh, this Northern Strategy focuses on four priority areas, uh, one promoting social and economic development, I don't think these are in order of, of preference, but uh, number two, protecting our environmental heritage, three, improving and devolving northern governance, and four, uh, exercising our Arctic sovereignty. So it's an ambitious plan to respond to the opportunities and challenges inherent to developing and governing an area with an incredible amount of natural resources, but a small population and, of course, a harsh environment. Canada recognizes now that the region as a whole evolves, um, will have, as the region evolves, it will have major implications for North America, and it's only through a strong partnership with our American neighbors that we can most effectively manage the environment and resources and promote the economic and social development of the communities who live there. In terms of the Arctic Council, one such forum where Canada is working with the U.S. Uh, and others is the Arctic Council. The Honorable Leona Aglukak, Canada's Minister of the Environment and Minister of the Canadian Northern Economic Development Agency and Minister of the Arctic Council, uh, began serving as Chair of the Arctic Council in May of, of this year. Over the next two years, the Arctic Council's overarching theme under Canada's leadership will be development for the people of the North. Um, we will put the interests of those who live in the Arctic first, hopefully, uh, the Council will focus on responsible resource development, safe Arctic shipping, and sustainable northern communities. I'm proud to say that making sure development in the North benefits northern communities is not just something we say at the Arctic Council, but I believe that the government is actively uh, living this reality. And that's why we're investing in projects such as the Canadian High Arctic Research Station, or CHARS, uh, this will be a world-class research station located in Cambridge Bay, Nunavut. Uh, with its Arctic-based operation, fostering both domestic and international collaboration, research, and innovation in the circumpolar uh, region. Being from Atlantic Canada myself, uh, we're very um, much um, interested in the development of a major shipbuilding program, uh, that's just getting underway in Nova Scotia at the Port of Halifax. And some $25 billion are being invested by the Government of Canada in building of uh, icebreaking capacity, particularly uh, for the Arctic. Another investment, of course, is in Aboriginal health research, uh, which for the first time requires researchers to collaborate with Aboriginals in four priority, priority areas, um, suicide, Fortunately, tuberculosis, obesity, and oral health, all 
uh, real problems today. There are three examples of projects our government has invested in that will bring to the table as examples to other Arctic states of how we must uh, ensure that people remain the focus. Development in the Arctic must be done in a responsible, environmentally responsible manner, manner uh, so that the land, water, and the seals and the animals that many northern people still depend on are not negatively impacted. In May of 2013, Arctic ministers signed the Agreement on Cooperation on Marine Oil Pollution Preparedness and Response. A potential oil spill obviously could have serious impacts on the livelihoods of northerners, and by acting together at the Council, Arctic states have enhanced our collective ability to respond. A new task force will develop a concrete action plan on oil pollution prevention and recommend how to implement it. It will consider what measures and actions could be taken to prevent future spills and how these could be advanced by the Arctic Council or Arctic states. The Council is establishing a Circumpolar Business Forum, which will enable Indigenous and non-Indigenous uh, business and industry to engage with the Arctic states and permanent participants. We will also continue the important scientific research that's been done by the Arctic Council. We need to combine the critical information and insights captured in the knowledge of the people who have lived in the North for generations with what we have learned through our scientific research and technology. And that's why the Council will develop recommendations for better incorporating traditional and local knowledge into its work during Canada's chairmanship. As Canada chairs the Council for the next two years, we are confident that by working with our Arctic Council partners, by continuing to face our common challenges together, and by building on the experience and knowledge gained over the last 16 years, we will advance strong, healthy, sustainable, and vibrant communities in the circumpolar region. The U.S. is indeed uh, Canada's premier partner in the, Ar in the Arctic. We pool our resources to achieve shared objectives uh, for the environment, safety, and security of the region and its inhabitants, for the advancement of Arctic research, and for sustainable development of Arctic resources. And as Arctic nations, we have similar interests in terms of organization of the Arctic Council. We welcome the United States partnership as we chair the Council as you prepare for your term uh, beginning in 2015. So today as we gather for John's presentation, uh, we should not only celebrate, uh, celebrate the tremendous history and culture of the Arctic people and the opportunities present in the region, we should also remain mindful of the importance of ensuring the sustainable development of the Arctic in a matter that benefits those who have lived there for millennia. So I'm sure you will enjoy the uh, movie and lecture tonight and uh, thank you for patiently uh, listening to a little bit of Canada's perspective. Thank you very much. And here's the main feature. <laughs> Thank you. And good evening, everyone. I'm really uh, honored and pleased to have been uh, invited down here. I thank uh, Kathleen Osgood. We've been com uh, communicating for quite some little time about this since we, we were, became Facebook friends some time ago and share these interests in the Arctic and so forth. And then I'm uh, grateful to the uh, Canadian Consulate and to uh, Patrick Benz as well for uh, coming and, and uh, helping with this whole event. It's, uh, it's, uh, as well as the uh, uh, Adventure Canada. I've been traveling with Adventure Canada as a resource guide for some uh, 22 years now. I just, uh, every year I, for at the beginning of it, I kept thinking, well, that's about enough. We've done that. We're going to kind of move on. But it's so great. <laughs> it's so amazing. You know, you see these enormous, you travel between these enormous icebergs and you're just dwarfed by them. And when you're trying to, to discuss these elements, these, uh, you know, non-human uh, uh, beings or persons, which is, I believe, a part of this, uh, a part of this course. Am I, is that better? A little, more. A little more like that somehow? <laughs> not like that. <clears throat> a little more not like that. <clears throat> I will try to be a little more not like that. So, okay, so uh, in, in order to try to get next to the kind of things which are the subject of this, of this course, the, of shamanism, of animism, and so forth, it's just struck me that to just get out there in raw nature, just get out there in the Arctic. And there are times when speeches are 
okay, you know, and I'll, I'll do my best here tonight, but there are other times when it's good for people to stop speaking and to just be, be there, be in nature, be surrounded by these amazing primal elements, which we have in, in great, we're lucky, both the uh, United States is lucky. I've spent enough time up in Alaska to see, you know, nature in the raw, and certainly the Canadian Arctic has great things to offer as well. So just to be out there in it, some of these ideas that we're gonna discuss tonight and some of the ideas that I'll be presenting in the film are ideas that seem a little odd in some ways, a little, a little out of the way unless you're, unless you're working with that material. But it all starts to make sense when you're out there and surrounded by these elements and you start thinking, well, what, what kind of a belief, belief system would you have? What, what, would you, what would you believe if you were out here for a few thousand years? It all starts to kind of make sense. I'm hoping, I'm hoping this film will take you a little bit closer to that. And I, I usually, I've, I've made six films now of my own and as well as helping a lot of people make, make their films. And uh, this was the uh, third one. It's a third of a trilogy, a kind of little Arctic trilogy I did. And I don't really, when I introduce a film, I don't kind of like to talk about the film. It's sort of the opposite. I kind of feel like, you know, if I, if I feel bound to stand up here and tell you for 10 minutes what I was trying to say in the film, ooh, that might be like a failed film, you know? You say, wow, I, I really got to try to get them now, you know, because they, they aren't going to get what I, what I did. So I'm not really going to talk about the film. I'm just going to say by way sort of, a, of oblique introdu introduction, there's a little feedback going on here. Is, uh, is it okay? Oh, okay. <clears throat> so just by way of a oblique sort of an introduction that each of my over about 12 years I've made six films and you know done other helped other people make films in between and so forth but I started to look at like what what it is like like why why would you make make a film like say Diet of Souls and in each case uh, as I was trying to think about it I kept thinking about like oysters Sounds a little odd. I kept thinking about oysters. And I thought about an oyster that gets a little bit of a, this uh, volcanic grit. It gets a little bit of a shard of something very, uh, very sharp uh, inside it. And then it sort of builds this pearl to try to protect itself from, for, to reconcile that, that shard. And I started realizing in a way that's kind of what I'm doing. Like each, each one of the films, something has bothered me or, or interested me or obsessed me in some way. And with this film, it was this, there's, there was a shaman named Ivaluaktuk, and you can read about him if you know the, the work of Knud Rasmussen. And if you don't, let me just say, okay, he's my hero. Go out, find Knud Rasmussen, read him all you can. The, uh, the, he was a Danish, but his, one of his uh, grandparents was uh, Inuit, Greenland, uh, Greenlandic and uh, he learned the language, and uh, he became the, the darling of, of Greenland. They called him Kunungwa, like our, our little darling Kunud. They embraced him, and uh, he did, in between 1921 and 1924, they, there's the report of the Fifth Thule Expedition, which went, they called it Across Arctic America. Well, some of us would like to say that a good bit of that was Canada, okay? But anyway, it's Arctic North America, whatever, whatever you like. And, uh, and he collected firsthand testimony from, from shamans, uh, practicing shamans. When he got into Igloolik, which was one of the heartlands of, of Inuit traditional culture, he asked if the missionaries had been there. And they said, and because he had the facility with the language, he could speak with them directly. And they said, what is a missionary? And he said, well, you know, they have long black robes and, uh, and big sleds piled high with stuff. Oh, right. Yes, we saw them. We saw them from afar, but they didn't stop here. So Knud managed to get into Iglulik before, before the missionaries did. And so they were just, it was just, he saw animism. He saw shamanism kind of on the vine. Like before it was something that they had to be kind of quiet about and look both ways and whisper about it in the dark or whatever. This was just everyday life. And one of the, sh the great shaman who he met was named Ava. And, and you'll, you'll, read, you'll read a lot about what Ava said, amazing person. But Ava's younger brother 
was named Ivo Lovarczuk, and he had this statement that he made to Knut, who beautifully translated it in, into Danish and then beautifully translated it into English. He was very gifted. And so he said, uh, Ivo Lovarczuk said one day when he was trying to explain Inuit life, he said, the great peril of our existence lies in the fact that our diet consists entirely of souls. A diet of souls. That got to me somehow. My mother used to read me that stuff when I was a kid, six years old. That's what she read me Rasmussen. I'm very grateful. She's gone now, but I'm very grateful. Anyway, so a diet of souls. What does that mean? What does it mean? If you are, if, 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 the other elements in your world are your spiritual equals, the animals, the other everything, all the elements of the world are your equals. In some cases, Inuit felt that some of the animals were their superiors. You're uh, a polar bear. You had to approach with reverence as a higher being. So they were either your equals or they were your superiors. And so how would you negotiate a world in which you were surrounded by all these other persons, non-human persons, some of whom were your spiritual equal, some of whom were your spiritual superior. And you're faced with the fact you don't have tofu bushes or you know mangoes or you don't have any of that stuff. You, if you're going to eat, you have to go and hunt these creatures which are your equal. So what is that? What is that? What does it mean to have a diet of souls? I didn't know, it bugged me. I spent a couple of years trying to find out. So without any further ado, I'd like to play Diet of Souls. We'll see how I did. And uh, we can, uh, I'll speak with you afterwards. We'll take some questions and so forth. So if we could get the lights dimmed, I'll hit, oh, whoa, you're good. I'll, I'll hit uh, play. I wonder about David Jr. Will his grandfather, Gino Akka, be able to pass on the mysterious charm that attracts the fish to the fisherman? Gino is a widower who spends a lot of his time out fishing and hunting for the community. He wants to teach his grandson, David Jr., to do the same, and he hopes it's not too late. always gives me uh, different feelings to see that film uh, over time. The, uh, the elders who informed that film are now uh, all gone. Every, every one of those has passed away. I made the film in uh, 2003 and uh, gradually, just steadily, I keep getting news from the different communities and the uh, Inuit are very gentle about uh, breaking news to you. They'll, sometimes it's, it's more by Facebook now than by phone, but you'll get a Facebook message and they'll say, uh, 
Have you heard any news from uh, Kugaruk, from the community of uh, Kugaruk? Because uh, if you haven't heard anything recently, maybe you should check in with your friends there. Uh, that's not going to go so well. So then I get a hold of Vincent Ninga or somebody, one of my friends in Kugao, and he says, oh yeah, yeah, this morning, you know, Gino Apta, the grandfather passed away or whatever, you get the news. And that's who's supposed to tell you because you, you share a lot of stuff and they can help you. They can say that, you know, all the good part as well as the, the sadness of missing them. And, uh, I was uh, going to try to address some of the uh, uh, overarching questions that uh, Kathleen had uh, kindly showed me today because I wanted to, for people who are uh, interested in this subject, I thought to try to say something that might be relevant. You know, as you're tr it's a big subject to try to grapple with. How do you the big thing is to, I think, to try to sort of glimpse it or glimmer it, you know, to, to get, a, get a sense of it. And that's, I tried to do that in the film. Some of it is the, sort of through the use of some of the imagery and not just sort of, not just like a lecture or like an essay, but also that you would, I don't know, sort of see things and hear things maybe, some things that are a little bit non-ordinary. My daughter is uh, Inuk, Inuk, she's uh, Inuit, Becky Khilabba. And uh, she was just visiting with us. Uh, we put her on an airplane in Halifax uh, yesterday. She went home. And uh, uh, she comes, to, she's a throat singer, and she came down in the studio while we were finishing up this film. And she did all the uh, non-ordinary sounds, like the throat singing sounds, like the, the, oh, oh, whoa. Or the, the big sound of the, of the polar bear sort of thing. Well, so she'd, uh, we'd uh, project it on the screen, and she'd sit there with headphones on, and she'd say, Okay, I've got it. I say, well, I can play it again. No, I'm good. That's all right. I say, so, shaman uh, transforming into a bear. You've got a sound ready for that. She'd say, yeah, I think so. <laughs> so, okay. And so anyway, and then when the, uh, they're going along by dog team, I, we took the sound of the dog. We, we carefully recorded the sound of the dogs, and then I checked that out. We used it as a guide, and then she did all the sound of the dogs going and stuff like that. So, it's a, a landscape where nothing is completely sure. You see dogs, but you hear a human, or you, there's a, a lot of, the, the world of animism, I think, was quite uh, playful, or you know, between, uh, well, there, there, was, uh, well, there was an old expression that said that the, the, the world of humans, uh, the world of humans and the world of animals coming together in the shaman, that was the title of one of Simon uh, Tehumel's prints. And then, the idea was that they sort of lived together in a, in a ways that maybe in elastic sort of ways. It wasn't like it is today where usually a relationship between a human and an animal, it's quite predictable how it will go. You know, I don't mean just the hunting, but there's either a pet over here or, you know, a, a living animal that gets killed and turned into meat over here, whatever. It's quite predictable how it's going to work out. And one thing that when Mariano Opilatrip was talking about the bear, and if you noticed the tremendous pains that were taken after the bear was killed to, to keep the bear's spirit from getting really angry at you and sort of lashing, lashing back at you. And uh, they were putting, taking, uh, if it was a female bear, taking women's things and putting them out in, in the bear's field of view for the three days. They felt that the, the soul of the bear was still there and powerful for about three days. So they would take all these precautions. And so that was thinking about a bear in a very, very different way. And, uh, and uh, you know, being actually fearing, fearing the bear. There's an old uh, Inuit song uh, in which, a drum song, in which uh, a man uh, explains about uh, how he managed to kill, kill a polar bear after a tremendous uh, struggle. And the end of the thing, it says that, uh, you know, the polar bear, the polar bear, mighty as, mighty as he was, he made, he made one mistake, you know. He turned his, he turned his back on me, he went over and lay down to sleep, little knowing that I too was a man. So there's stuff like that that just leaves you, leaves you in between worlds, you know. And so anyway, these uh, overarching questions, there's uh, what is the relationship between humans and other than human, other than human beings? And when I was a kid, 
in Cape Dorset, southwestern Baffin Island. I grew up there. And when I was a kid, I was fortunate enough to grow up with two mother tongues, uh, English and Inuktitut at the same time. And I speak them both the same, <laughs> with equal difficulty, I guess. And, <coughs> and uh, <coughs> when I was a kid, I thought that the uh, Inuktitut word for, net, for her seal was Netiapik, because that's all everybody, everybody, the people would say Netiapik, Netiapik. And it was only later when I started to understand grammar and so on better, I discovered that apik is a term of endearment. The word for seal is netzil. I n nobody ever said netzil. They'd say the deer seal or the darling seal. All the time I was a kid, they said, they said that so often that that's what I thought the word for seal was. So the, the, it's a different, my mother would say when she was trying to explain to people about how much things have changed and we were talking about the seal and she'd, by way of trying to explain it, she'd say, it's a different, it's a different hunter today and it's a different seal. It's a different seal because when, when people were going out for seal back in the past, it was everything. The seal was everything. The seal was like your clothing, light, it, the seal, you'd burn, burn it in the seal oil lamp, which would give you light yeah, in an otherwise, you know, dark, the world could be dark for months other than this light that was given to you by the seal. And it was heat to heat your, your igloo. It was, it provided the heat. It had, it had everything and your food. It had, it had everything, it had everything you needed. So in your world at that time, if when Gino Akka crouching over that seal hole and it was like, it was life or death. So that seal was, your, you know, giver of life. It, the seal could give you life and give your family life. Now today, people still hunt seal. People very much enjoy the taste of seal, as you may have seen toward the beginning of the film. I'm rather partial to, to seal myself and, uh, and so on. But it's, it's, a, it's a part. It's a, it's a part of everything. You can also go, they, they, uh, by airplane, they, they jet uh, uh, cargo in, uh, what is it, Pizza Hut, I think it is. You can get these uh, you know, boxes about this big from, I think it's Pizza Hut, it's one of those anyway. And uh, there you are. So, you know, I'll have some seal, maybe I'll have some pizza. Or you have so many more options today that you can't look at the seal in the same way. You, it's difficult for someone to arrive today at seeing the seal the way people would see in a time when, when animism was fully in effect. These animals were, were um, what would you say, almost kind of archetypal, I guess. And they were in perfect health. They hadn't today, they talk about the dioxins, the persistent organic pollutants, which are now lodging in the, the fat of, for example, the deep diving mammals and the bears. That's kind of a, a whole other talk. My, my wife would do that one much better. She's a marine biologist, but, but uh, in any case, the, the uh, the the fact that today you've got animals that in some cases are not that that healthy an animal and all anyway you don't it's not life itself to you anymore and so forth so you're looking at a seal in a different way it's very hard for you to arrive for us it's very hard for us to arrive at a vision of the animal that would see the animal as a kind of like a glowing perfect being and especially when the outcome was uncertain, the outcome of your interaction with an animal was, was to be determined. If a human met a bear, that could go any which way. And a human went out to try to bring a seal home, if the seal, you know, which would result in the death of a seal, if the human wasn't able to connect with the seal, maybe it would result in the death of the person. So you, it was, it was, like life or death, everybody was on the edge of their seat. Animals kind of meant everything. And then today, it's difficult. You, if you go to a, a zoo, you, you, you know, the animals are very handy, you know, they're, they're encapsulated. It's very, very safe. It's a very safe, um, kind of a, almost a one-way uh, interaction. And not an interaction, a one-way, it's a one-way action. And I would like for all of you to, to take, maybe you have had opportunities like this, but to take an opportunity, if you can, to get out there, to get out in, in nature, to get out there where all of a sudden we say, you know, I'm a, actually a, in my uh, other job, I'm a polar bear guard. 
And uh, when we take people ashore, we, you know, I have to wear a gun and do all that sort of stuff. And we have to guard people because there are times when all of a sudden there's a polar bear who's really, really interested in all of us and is coming closer and closer and so on. We have safe, wa safe ways to, to prevent that interaction from going, going too far. But there is just a moment there when you suddenly realize, ah, yikes, you know, like, where, where's my support system? You know, I've got, to, I've got to get into a zodiac. I've got to get away from here, that sort of thing. So I guess when you say what is the relationship between humans and other than human beings, it, it seems like in animism it used to be a, a continuum and everybody felt like they were part of this whole great continuum, but they were a very respectful part of it. And my friend um, Anne Mikituk Hansen, an Inuit woman who has been uh, the, the uh, commissioner of, of uh, Nunavut and so forth, she's very, she's been a, I don't know what, what she hasn't done would be a, a, a easier list to describe. She's been a, a Hollywood a lead in a Hollywood film. She was a broadcaster for 30 years plus and so on. And we went on one of these voyages, these Adventure Canada voyages together, and we got over to Greenland, Idlurisset, the place where all these icebergs are calving off. And we were going to go out among the icebergs, and uh, duties were being assigned to the staff. And Anne, who is normally the soul of cooperation, uh, she said, well, she said, here's, uh, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go out among the icebergs. I'll, I'll take part in the town walk, and that's what I'm going to do today. And I was a little stunned. I've known her. She's like a part of sort of extended family to me. And she's always been so cooperative and so collaborative on everything. And I thought, wow, she's really kind of, she's laying down the law. This is how she's going to do it. And so on. And that just didn't sound like her. And I thought, well, um, you know, it sort of teach you. They think, well, people, you, you know these people and you love them. So you just think whatever they do, it's with a reason. So I thought the reason will come out and let's just wait and we'll, we'll watch and we'll see. So we did the town tour, we came back, we had a little meeting and Anne said to the staff, she said, I'm so sorry. She said, I want to apologize to each and every one of you. I must have sounded like a real egomaniac this morning when I told you I wasn't going to go there and we didn't have time to explain and there were lots of people around. But she said, now I can tell you. She said, I thought everything was going to be fine. I looked out over the, uh, over the uh, rail of the ship and I saw all these icebergs. I suddenly realized, what am I thinking? These are powerful people, is what she said. These are powerful people and I can't be among them. She said, I think I'll, I'll suffocate. I think if, I, if I'm between three icebergs, that's too much power. There's too many of them, too much power, and I think I'll stop breathing and die. So she said, that's, now you can understand that, you know, I, I, that's why I laid down the law and decided not to go there. I was sort of protecting myself. And so we all said, okay, all right, that's fine, you know. And then we remembered other times that we were going there. We say, well, I'd say, well, now Anne's going to be doing shore duty and I'll go, I'll go in and among the icebergs and so she wouldn't have to explain herself again. The next uh, one that people are thinking about, the overarching question is, what is the validity or effectiveness of shamanic work? And if I don't, I'm not sure whether that quest question deals with sort of the Arctic context, because of course there's shamanic work being done various, in various ways all over the world uh, and so on. But in the Arctic context, I'd have to say who, um, the shamanic work, like whom, whom is it serving today? I think it's, it's a part of, if you study the, the Grail story, that was the great question that uh, Parsifal was supposed to ask when he got into the Grail castle. Whom does the Grail serve? That's the words he was supposed to say, and he blew it and took him 20 years to get back in the Grail castle, you know, and finally he blurted out his little, his little question he was supposed to ask. But it's a great question. You know, as you go, you're on a journey. I think everyone in this room is on a journey. And as you encounter various different things, there's a, this question that Parsifal was supposed to ask. It cuts through so many things. And you just ask, uh, of anything, whom does it serve? There are times when there's a big question going on and you know, it seems so complicated. And I've learned you know, from that to just stop and say, well, whom does it serve? And that's what I was asking myself when we said, what is the validity or effectiveness of shamanic work? And I think today one would have to ask, whom it's serving, because what happened was shamanism in the Arctic basically got taken apart. The, the missionaries came in and they said, 
That's it, that, the old way. Not only are you supposed to not practice it, you're not supposed to teach it. You're not supposed to tell any stories related to it. And not only are you supposed to not tell any stories related to it, you are forbidden to think those things. You must expunge them from your memory so that at, after your generation, everything to do with sh shamanism, everything to do with animation will be gone. Your children, the child of a shaman, would not know that their father or mother had been a shaman. That's how pervasive. It's, if you wish, that's, it's cultural genocide, if you would like to, to call, you know, call a spade a spade. It didn't work. It, it sort of half worked and it partly didn't work because uh, Inuit are very independent people and they decided whether they were going to remember things or not remember things and some of them quietly remembered. And you see some of them here that I came along. Some of the people talking there had not said a thing for 60 years. There was one fellow there who hadn't said a word for 70 years. And he said, well, I'm going to speak now because they started to sense their own mortality and they thought, well, whom, who am I helping by keeping quiet? I'm helping a missionary who's been dead for 50 years, you know, whereas my son or daughter could maybe, maybe use some of this. So it, today you'd have to say who is, are there people practicing uh, shamanism today overtly in the Arctic? Not really. I got to know, my, I'm going to show my second film, Nuliayo, and in Nuliayo we met a man who came out, you know, it's like coming out. He came out and said, yes, I was a shaman. I'm a retired shaman. I dedicated the film, film to him, Victor Tungilik. And uh, I asked him why he stopped practicing shamanism and, he, and what he used to heal. And he said his healing power only came when people gave him something. And I said, oh, well, you know, that's kind of handy. People come in. He said, no, it could be anything. It wasn't, it didn't have to be something of particular value, but the kind of magic or the power wouldn't work if, if they had to be committed. That's what it turned out to be. They had to commit, I need you to help me. And here, here is this thing, which was a tangible, tangible proof of that. And then that would allow him to work and he could kind of heal certain things. He said, and then white folks, he said, you guys started doing uh, medevac, like uh, medical evacuation flights. He said, I couldn't touch that. He said, you know, I got a little bit of power. I can't medevac people, you know, if they have some big problem. And he said, so gradually he came to realize he was just, he was just beat, you know, beaten on, on all hands. He just couldn't really continue to practice anymore. So he kind of, he kind of sort of quietly drifted, drifted into the past and he didn't tell people he was supposed to not mention about that anymore so he stopped talking about it until we went to visit him and he, he came and he came out and talked with us and he explained about some of his, some of his powers but uh, it, it, it really was kind of killed and so today it would be interesting, I think it would be very interesting for people, there are young people who are thinking about this, who are thinking, what, does it, what did it mean and what would it mean today? It's, a, it's like, it would be a, just like, it's not the same hunter and it's not the same seal, it's not the same shaman by the same, same token, because that whole world is not life itself you know, a anymore. I mean, maybe in the grander sense it is, because here we are trying to survive as a species on the planet, and possibly if you take the highest sort of look at it, maybe it's as important or more important than it ever was that someone like a shaman could intervene between the world of humans and the world of animals and help us figure this whole thing out, because I, I personally think we're kind of messing it up. So, but it, it would be worth take, taking a harder look at that. Um, what has the role of shamanism been in the circumpolar world? It strikes me that there's a kind of an intervention. I think I see the shaman as being a kind of an intervener between the world of, of humans and the world of animals. And the, a shaman, you may know that there's this ritualistic idea that to become a shaman, you particularly with some of the more powerful of the, of the animal spirits, that the shaman would get devoured. Have you heard about, about that, that in the, it's a part of the journey of the shaman, that the shaman, for example, and it could be a male or female, you know that, right? It's a Siberian Tungus word. It doesn't mean shaman like M-A-N being like a male gender thing. It's like many, some of the most powerful shamans were women. But in any case, so a, a shaman would, would uh, an apprentice might go into a, an igloo 
and fast. They were supposed to have their clothes, rips in their clothing. They were supposed to be sort of poor and clothing ripped. And they'd go into an igloo. They were supposed to build themselves an igloo in the winter. And they were supposed to build it kind of sloppily and leave holes. Like they didn't, weren't supposed to chink it up too much. There were supposed to be little holes all over the place. And then they'd go in there and all they had was a water from the snow and they, would, they wouldn't bring food mm. in. And they were supposed to stay in there for one moon. If you can just imagine, like staying in there for one minute would already be quite challenging. And they were supposed to kind of live in there for a month and fast and wait for a visitation. They were hoping to be chosen by, and this is the other thing that's hard to understand today. Whenever we think of animals, we are in our mind, we are thinking of ourselves as the dominant dominant one. It's hard to imagine that mindset where you're poor and small and starving and huddling in this little badly made uh, windy igloo hoping that the spirit of an animal might come along and see you and find you, you know, not totally without worth, you know, and, and decide that, that you could be their, their host. And then you would, you would, your power would be from them. You would have the power of the animal, right? And so, so it's it's a it's a very it's a very very different relationship. And uh, you once you that that animal, if it's let's say like the spirit of a of a of a polar bear, Nanoklu, the the polar bear spirit, would devour you, and you would then be reborn. And when you were reborn, you would not be you would be neither strictly human nor strictly animal, but you would be part human and part animal. And so you would be a special being and you would have the ability to intervene or to, to sort of pass between and communicate between the world of, of humans and the world of animals. You'd be very useful now to the community who are trying to figure out if nobody's been getting any seals. Why? Why, has, why are we starving? Why has nobody been getting seals? We don't know. We're, we're just dying. We don't know. But the shaman would have to go and find out and come back to the people and say, you know, there are sins, you're committing some sins, you're maybe not being respectful enough of the animals or whatever it is. And now if you fix those things, then the animals are gonna to start to be available to you again. So kind of an intermediary, I would say, would be the primary role that, I, that would come to mind. How has shamanism impacted contemporary indigenous identities? How has, I was talking with Kathleen about this earlier, how has shamanism impacted contemporary indige indigenous identities? And you can look at, this is one of those questions, you can sort of look at it both ways. I see it the other way around. I think it's, I think it's the, for it, to my mind, it's the other, I grew up in an Aboriginal setting, it's the other way around. And rather than saying, um, how has shamanism impacted contemporary indigenous identities, I don't think shamanism came along and impacted I think of shamanism as having been there since the beginning, since, since people probably here on earth, since people had fire, you know, since people g went into a cave mouth and put a fire outside the cave mouth and then looked out and saw the pupils of wild animals around, right? <laughs> and wondered what those animals were and wished they had the powers of those animals and so forth. I mean, shamanism is the oldest religion on earth. And I think that of shamanism as having always been there. And then what impacted, what came along is the, the uh, uh, contemporary indigenous identities. What, what impacted on shamanism? And of course that was, at first it was the, the missionaries, right? The shamans tried to resist. For example, there's a well well documented in, in uh, Inuit folklore in the Cumberland Sound. The Anglican missionary Edmund James Peck came in in 1990, 1893, and he was teaching the syllabics, the, uh, the the Inuit writing, which is the sort of deltas, and you've probably seen the writing. And he was trying to teach the writing on an old slate uh, chalkboard, and the shamans would not go to the lessons. But they, had, they tried to get the population there, the, the community, to act up the, like their friends within the community. They'd say, well, well, do monkey shines and stuff in the classroom. We don't want people to learn the writing because the, the, you're going to end up belonging to the white man if, if as, soon as, the, you can, as soon as he can get you to write to write and read, then you're going to get the Bible scripture and all that, which, and so, so it was. So they'd, he'd make a symbol like this, like, 
nah, like that. And you know, somebody in the class would go, huh, oh, that looks just like a seal, a basking seal. Don't you think that looks like a seal? Oh yeah, really? You know, so they were all just trying to cut up and kind of wreck the class. And so to, to stave off this impact, and that's the way I feel that the impact really happened. And it didn't really work because gradually some of the other uh, Inuit came to think this could be useful. It could be very useful to have a writing system. So then they said to the shamans, stop wrecking the classes, we, we want to learn. And so the, the whole, there was the beginning, the beginning of, of, of a very, very different, I'm not saying that it, it became worse or better, but an entirely different uh, uh, world. So what is the potential of, this is a loaded question coming up here. What is the potential of shamanism to reconcile the challenges of globalization and climate change in a circumpolar world? What is the potential of shamanism to reconcile the challenges of globalization and climate change in a circumpolar world? Wow. I, I have two completely conflicting thoughts about that. You know, they probably cancel each other out handily. And that is that I think the potential is great. That's why, one of the reasons why I, I made this film is because you probably notice those elders, they're kind of, even in translation, they're heavy hitters, right? They, they, have, they have really active minds and they kept me, you know, on the edge of my seat. And I was only able to present a very small part of what they said. I've got the rest is all in transcripts and so forth. But there's, there is wisdom there. But who's listening? I think that's the big question is, is, you know, when you say, what is the potential? The potential is great. I'd say the potential is equal to our will to hear. And if we were to go in and a bit as I did, you know, I might say, uh, if we were to go in with open, you know, open hearts and open, open ears, open arms, and to sit down with them and to say, you know, we've, we're at a crossroads, like we've taken this whole, this whole thing of stewardship of the earth, like we sort of took it over, we sort of, as a, as a civilization, we sort of grabbed a hold of this and we've, you know, run it kind of up till now, but we've, we're messing up, you know, we're, we're, we're extinguishing species at an at a, a, a outrageous rate and we're, we're, we have a lot of issues, there are a lot of things that we're not able to accomplish. But we also have tremendous capability. We have amazing, amazing abilities. If we could all get together, if we could all be of one mind and get together and decide what it was that, that has to be done, then we have amazing uh, systems, you know, and amazing knowledge of our own. So the question is, is how to get everything all together. The idea that some of the world's, you know, the great, the great minds of the earth could kind of get together people who have the power to really do things. And that they, and I don't just mean Inuit, but I mean to get together with the, the people who are most in touch with the earth, the, you know, the sort of hunter-gatherer peoples, if you will, like, like all over the world, and their, their shamans or their, their wise people, and really, really talk, but not in some sort of a, a patronizing or condescending way where the outcome is all a, a foregone conclusion, but to go in and say, this can go anywhere. I think some amazing things could happen. I mean, I know just in my own life, amazing, some of the stuff that the, the elders have said some things to me that just stay with me kind of every day since. And I don't think it would be any less of an amazing experience. But the question is, is do we have time to do that? Everything's speeding up. You know, the Northwest Passage, right? It's big business now. It's just about to be a big, big deal. The Arctic's be got f gone from being a sort of marginalized kind of a Back, backyard, you know, mineral rich, but, but you know, it, it's hard to uh, extract, it's expensive to extract the stuff, to all of a sudden it's very much front and center, it's very much on the world stage, things are getting going faster and faster and faster. I doubt that anyone has the time or is going to make the time to really stop and really sit down. The elders used to be, when I was a kid, when you came traveling and you came into a community, you almost felt the the need to check in kind of with the elders when you came into a community. And even in 1975, when I, w when I went into uh, Pangerton, if you arrived by airplane, 
you know, you would stop and the elders were there and they wanted to know, like, well, what are you doing in our community? Not in a confrontational way, but in an interested way. Sometimes they were in a position to help you do something if it seemed like a commendable idea. And then they sort of gave up because so many people with so many briefcases, with so many agendas in such a hurry. And uh, at one point there was a, a, a kind of a, a group who were in there to uh, talk about uh, offshore oil. They wanted to drill all kinds of oil. And uh, they said, we're here, it's a, it's a sort of a town hall meeting, you know, and uh, don't get the idea, this isn't one of those, you know, perfunctory, you know, we're just here for five minutes to be able to say we've been here. We really want to dialogue with you. We want to sit down with you. Your agenda is our agenda. Your timeline is our timeline. You know, we're here, and, and this, was in, this was in Pangnertung, okay? Now, in Pangnertung, the, the, uh, I went to the first part of this meeting. I had to leave at a certain point because I had a, you know, without wishing to be rude, that thing called a, a bullshit meter. And it was just went off the scale for me. And at a certain point, I kind of had to leave. But uh, while I was there, they were saying, okay, you know, we want, wish to hear all your wisdom. And we, we have all the time in the world. And the thing they weren't counting on is in a small Arctic community like Pangnertung, the uh, airstrip is in the center of town. It's a little dangerous. I lived right on the airstrip in a little Quonset hut and I kept hoping some twin otter wasn't gonna come through my living room. And there's no place in the community you could go where you, you would get very far from the airstrip. So while they were there and saying, we've got all the time in the world, there's this high pitched whine Whee! from the airstrip. Everyone in town could hear it. They never shut down the jet. Okay, so the old thing of speaking with forked tongue, it's kind of like, am I going to believe your words or am I going to believe the whine of your jet? You know, that kind of stuff. So I'd suggest that if we could switch the jet off, you know, shut it down, tell the jet pilot to go, go to the hotel because we're not traveling today. We're here to listen. I think some magical things could happen. So then there's a last one here which says, how does belief or non-belief impact on the understanding of spirit worlds and spirit mastery? How does belief or non-belief impact an understanding of spirit worlds and spirit mastery? And a big, big subject, I'll just take one swipe at that. Um, I think it's the same as with any religion or with any system of sustainable values. I don't think you have to particularly believe in it to be able to see its, its benefit. I think that with any system of sustainable values, you could, you, could look, um, you could look at the results over time. You could, you could look at the people and you could, you could see by the fruits, I guess sort of like the fruits of their labors. That you could, so it's the same with shamanism, that if you had a system of where people were practicing shamanism and living in animism, and you could take a look at that and look at it over time and say, what has it produced? Are these people killing themselves off by the day and by the hour, or how are they living? And rather than, it might almost be easier to see it clearly if you didn't believe in it in a weird way, you know, because if you believe in it, then you're, you're, you're right in there. But to step back and to say, how is this life going? And th this will be, that'll be my last com comment before we, we open to, to uh, any questions or comments you may have. But it's an interesting fact that in all those thousands of years, my friend uh, Bob, Robert McGee, an uh, 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 archaeologist with the uh, Canadian Museum of Civilization, and he and I have this lively discussion going on. And I asked him, you know, Bob, uh, about extinctions and so on. The Inuit have been uh, hunting people and they really, really are good at it. <laughs> and they, they, have, they have applied their best hunting practices daily for, you know, centuries and even millennia. And there's a relatively, you know, how there are, there are these animals there, how come they're not all extinct with so many people going at the animals all the time? And I said, how many animals have been driven to extinction during the, the tenure of the Inuit in the Arctic? And uh, Robert McGee says, not one. He says he cannot point out a species that, that was driven to extinction. So you could say, is that a glorious mistake? You know, they just kind of didn't get around to it or, you know, they're something. 
Or was there intention? Was there something deep underneath that? Was there a deep idea? And Simon Tukumil speaks to that when he says that the caribou herd are coming by and the elders are saying, don't take the first ones. We want them always to feel good about coming back here. So let the one whole day, let the vanguard all go through untouched. They're going to love coming through this area. And then we'll take what we need out of the sort of the middle group in such a way that it wouldn't panic the herd or anything like that. That's just one of thousands of observations of, of taboos and rituals that were part of the old way. And my, I guess, I guess my great regret is we were, I think, simplistic. Like I'm, I'm an Anglican, a Arctic, was brought up an Arctic Anglican, and my people, the Anglicans, missionaries, and certainly others as well, I think were, were really uh, simple or simplistic. When we, we looked at, we said, everything that has to do with shamanism, we've got to wipe it out. And the shamanism or animism was the underpinning of everything, of everything everything you think about, everything you do, it was, it was bubbled underneath. It was like the tap roots that fed everything. So it doesn't mean that everything was all about shamanism, but it means that nothing was unrelated to shamanism. So then all of a sudden, in come the missionaries and they say, okay, if it's related to, to shamanism, it's gotta be chopped off and it's gotta die, be left to die. So for example, all the music, what, you know, Inuit had the drum, the drum was forbidden. Inuit had throat singing, the throat singing was forbidden. It's only now that they're kind of starting to come back. And there are areas in the Arctic where people say, people will tell me, Inuit will tell me, they say, well, they, they never had the drum here. I know they drummed up around Igloolik, but they never drummed here. I say, I, I, I'll show you engravings from 1886 of your great-great-grandparents dr drum dancing. Franz Boas, you know, they, they, they did the engravings and so on. That, that's right here in your town. Probably someone related to you. And it's captured in an engraving. What do you think of that? Oh, but no, no, but we didn't have that here because the missionaries told us so, you see. So it, that is the problem is that the, the baby got thrown out with the bathwater. That's the problem. That, that, that today it's very hard to, to see how pervasive that was but it's, uh, it's the unfortunate part that when you're trying to go and find out more about animism, you will have some difficulty because people are even afraid to speak up about it. Fortunately, they're starting to speak out, you know, in the sort of few years, typically they sort of, somebody would speak out and then maybe the following year they'd die. So they're really just, they're, it's just sort of that last moment when they think, if not now, then when? That's kind of what you're looking at. Well, any questions or comments while we're still together? Any at all? Yes, sir. Have no, sorry, just behind you. Yes. Have the Inuit seen this movie, and have, has your movie had any effect on the uh, revival of shamanism in any way? Have the Inuit seen this movie, and has it had any effect on the revival of shamanism? Certainly, Inuit have seen it. Uh, it's been broadcast by uh, f uh, four different uh, channels including the Aboriginal channel, and it's been seen, you know, hundreds of times in, in Canada. It's broadcast sort of, st you know, still, they keep showing it. Uh, pro I don't know that every single Inuk has seen it, but I know that when I go through airports, I get this little cluster of kids around me, you know, and they say, well, did you make that movie? You know, I say, and one kid says, oh, I saw that one uh, 36 times, you know. <laughs> and the other kid says, you didn't. You I saw it 94 times, you know, <laughs> and then, you know, just when you think that they're just, you know, trying to make a sort of a older guy feel good or something like that, they start quoting dialogue. They start quoting verbatim lines from the, the film. So, so yeah, it's kind of in there. It's sort of, it's sort of part of the scenery there. What you'll see, it's subtle though. What you'll see is that like a, a girl, a young woman will uh, Facebook message me to say that she's decided to do her school, her high school project on some aspect of, of this, some aspect of shamanism. And I, and the fact that she's kind of messaging me to tell me, and she's sort of, she says that this was something she didn't know. There are times when I have connected up kids with their grandparents. And he, I would never have had to do that in the past. Like it was a sacred relationship between the, the grandparents, between the elders and the youth. That's how all teaching was really done. The people in the middle were so busy trying to keep the camp alive they were very busy, and the older people had 
time and the kids had time and they got together and all this learning happened and we we unplugged that basically and uh, they're trying to sort of pull that together now and there are cases where there are young people where they'd see the movie and they'd say with this Melanie Panya said I'm uh, she says I'm really upset I'm really upset and I thought she was kind of mad at me and she said uh, I'm really upset it's not with you she said my father never told me any of that stuff, all that shamany stuff. I didn't think he knew a thing about it. And, she, and I said, oh yeah? And she says, well, I got a plan. Melanie has a plan. She says, I'm going, she's working in Ottawa. She says, I'm going back to Glulik this summer. And she said, I have it all planned out. I can see my dad, Hervé, he's there at the kitchen table, you know, and I'm gonna bring him a cup of tea. Here, dad, here's a cup of tea. You want some bannock with that? Here's some, you know, bread, like, here's some bannock. Okay, you good? You want another cup of tea? And maybe give him another cup of tea. And I'm just going to keep feeding him tea and bannock until he can't uh, take anymore. And at a certain point, he's going to say, look, whoa, I'm stuffed, I'm done. You know, I'm, I'm happy, I'm good. He's good, okay, all relaxed, everything good. You've had your tea, you've had your bannock, good. Now why don't you tell me about these uh, old shamanic uh, stories? <laughs> tell, tell me about the mother of the sea beasts, you know. I know you know the story well because you told it to some passing white guy. <laughs> <laughs> How are we for time? Are we, are we? I, th I think we'd have time for one more question here. Yes, sir. Just curious, Steve. the story you told earlier, Quinn, back in ancient times when you were eight years old, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, of the, the two words that you thought was the single word for seal, uh, I won't try to recapitulate them, yeah. but uh, I'm, I'm curious if you would go back today and listen, would the people have dropped the endearment and just used the term seal? Because your point was so graphic that it's not only different people, it's a different seal. Yeah. I just wonder if that's reflected in wisdom. Okay, that's a, this is a really good question, and that's where a lot of things get learned in the subtleties of language, because, you know, people, there are sort of speeches being made, you know, you have sometimes, you know, uh, like a, a political leader will say, you know, like our elders and our this and our that, and it all sounds kind of pretty great. It is interesting to go and parse out the sentences and see what's really going on, so I appreciate your question. And yes, I would say on a couple of levels, I think that that has kind of slid that that whole thing of you of throwing in the words of endearment everywhere that that seems to have slipped. I some, I still do it because that's what I grew up with. And sometimes people are kind of find it a little odd uh, in a, of a certain generation. And uh, that's that's uh, one part of it. And then the other part of it is <clears throat> that it used to be taboo to mention uh, to, to you couldn't say um, like in, in, in uh, English, we could say, uh, you, do you like fish? Do you like to eat fish? You could say that. In Inuktitut, it used to be taboo. You couldn't say that because you had to respect the different states of, of, like, of like living and, and death, and you wouldn't eat a living fish. So you couldn't say, I, I like eating fish. You had to say, I like eating what's left after the soul is gone out of the fish sort of thing. And, and the, the, the way to say that is uh, uh, is fish, is what remains, like what's left behind, what the fish leaves behind. Like that, I haven't ever translated it like that, but that's sort of, sort of. And so you say like, I enjoy eating what the fish leaves behind, right? Or I enjoy eating what the seal leaves behind. Today I'm hearing, increasingly I'm hearing people of a younger generation hearing uh, I can, oh, I can hardly say that, that it's sort of like, it's sh sort of shocking. I, I was trying to say an example, but, but I jump when I say it. That means like, would you like to eat seal without putting in like the part about it being left behind? And you just, you sort of hear that around now. So yeah, there's, there's, some, there's some slippage. Makes you, makes you wish that there could be a kind of a move in the other direction because what we're all talking about you know, trying to save the planet and be conscious and, and walk correctly on the earth and so on. And all of those old values, that's, to me, that's kind of what they were, that sort of walk with respect kind of thing. Thanks. Thank you very much.